Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. Under Jurgen Klopp, Dortmund returned to the golden era. They took the Bundesliga and Europe by storm, winning several honours within Germany as well as reaching the Champions League final. But since Klopp has left, Dortmund have had four managers, all with varied success. The worry was, it seemed the gap between Bayern and Dortmund was ever increasing and growing to a size that couldn't be clawed back. That was until Lucien Favre took over. In 2018-19, Favre led Dortmund to within inches of the title, missing out by just two points in the end and giving Bayern their biggest title challenge in years. But how did Favre bring about this change? In this video we take a look at how Favre transformed Dortmund. Just before we get into that though, if you're new around here, I'd appreciate it if you liked, commented and subscribed. If you want to see more match reviews, player and manager profiles and so much more. Drop video suggestions below or tweet at Football Made Simple. Now, let's get into it. And if you want to keep up with Dortmund, as well as any team of your choosing, a great place to do so is OneFootball, which has all the latest match notifications, club news and more. So download it through the link in the description. So to understand how Favre changed Dortmund's fortune, we need to understand the seasons leading up to it. Klopp will undoubtedly go down in the Dortmund history books, having won two Bundesligas, two Super Cups, a DFB Pokal, as well as getting to the Champions League final in 2012-13. But in 14-15, Dortmund imploded. After finishing a respectable second in the 13-14 season, and winning the Super Cup at the start of the 14-15 season, everything seemed to be going to plan. However, Dortmund did poorly in the league, finishing in 7th and barely qualifying for the Europa League. One of the problems was that his team had been systematically decimated by European powerhouses taking their best talents, not least Bayern Munich, who secured Goethe and Lewandowski in back-to-back -back seasons. A second hypothesis was that years of playing Klopp's Gagan pressing style had worn away at the squad, as it is a physically demanding style. So when he left, Dortmund brought in an astute replacement in Thomas Tuchel, who had previously done well replacing Klopp at Mainz. At Mainz, he had used an attack-focused, high-energy style whilst also using young players, all traits which Dortmund valued and would help for an easy transition from the Klopp era. His time there was a success, finishing second during his first season and third the next behind a strong Leipzig side, whilst winning the DFB Pokal. However, it's important to note that despite their good league positions, they were never realistically in a title challenge in either season, finishing 10 and 18 points behind Bayern in each season. Tactically, Tuchel did employ a similar concept to Klopp, but he did adapt it. Initially, he started with a 4-2-3-1 and focused more on keeping the ball when in possession, as shown by the statistics. This meant that players got more time to rest on the ball and could conserve some energy. But when off the ball, they used this conserved energy to press more consistently. But Tuchel also brought around increased tactical intelligence by seamlessly switching formations from a 4-3-3 to a 3-4-3 and even a 4-2-3-1 throughout the season. A prime example is Julian Weigl, who arrived from 1860 Munich a promising defensive midfielder and quickly learned to adapt to being a deep-lying playmaker or a defensive powerhouse depending on the system that they were using. This was just one of several young players to thrive under Tuchel, including Dembele and Pulisic. These two combined with Royce and Aubameyang meant Dortmund attacked with a pace and ferocity that overwhelmed opponents. But Tuchel faced many of the same problems that Klopp did, clashing with Watzke over continued sales of the club's best players, which meant that he left the club just days after winning the Pokal. And then came the 17-18 season, the last one before Favre, with Peter Bosch being appointed after Europa League final appearance with Ajax. As always, Dortmund were attracted to him due to his ability to work with young squads in addition to the front foot, high pressing system that he used. But it was to be a short spell, with Bosch being sacked on the 10th of December, with Dortmund lingering in 8th place in the league and having failed to win a single Champions League group stage match. It was odd because Dortmund started strong, leading the table until match day 9, where their tactical inefficiencies became clear. Michael Zork said that a major reason for bringing in Bosch was to bring defensive solidity. However, just the opposite happened. Dortmund were productive in attack, scoring the joint most in the league. However, defensively, only four teams conceded more often than they did. Bosch would point to a string of injuries they suffered in defence, to key players such as Pisek, Durm, Schmalzer, Bartra and Toprak, all of whom were sidelined for a period. While Bosch might see this as bad luck, consistent injuries are a sign of flawed playing style or training method. At Ajax, Bosch had a young team who could press incessantly, but Dortmund was slightly older so this did not translate as well. And this, combined with the fact that he had less possession at Dortmund than at Ajax, meant more strain was being placed upon the team. 
Dortmund tended to fade in the second half of matches, conceding most of their goals in the second half, showing that there may have been a problem with the physical demands. His offensive tactics were not a problem, using the wings well when attacking. Often he would allow Aubameyang to drop during the build-up, opening gaps centrally which the wingers would attack whilst the midfield moved high. As a result, wide players like Pulisic thrived, whilst Aubameyang would often arrive in the box to finish as well, going at 1.17 xG per 90 under Bosch. But the defence was a major problem. In order to support the high pressing style, his defence held a very high line, often right on the halfway line. When you consider the back four included Socrates and a returning from injury Pishek, meaning that they weren't the quickest, it becomes clear that this was a poor plan. Many teams countered easily into this space, and Dortmund conceded the second most counter-attack goals. The high line also meant Dortmund midfielders could not be comfortable on the ball. As Weigl said, even small mistakes led to goal-scoring chances for the opposition. So, Dortmund often bypassed the midfield when attacking, leading to an uncontrolled rhythm. Stoger was brought in as his replacement, and steadied the ship as Zork predicted, allowing them to qualify for the Champions League on the final day of the season. The tactical change he made was firstly lowering the defensive line, in order to provide more protection for Berkey. The lower line also meant that when there was a turnover in possession, the Dortmund midfield had time to retreat, usually dropping into a 4-1-4-1 with a defensive midfielder being key to the process. As opposed to a high pressing system, they now opted for a more zonal method, which allowed them to plug any gaps by keeping the midfield narrow. By falling deep, they would open up gaps in the opposition defence which Royce and Pulisic could counter-attack into. But the problem with Stoger was that he stripped Dortmund of their identity. Whilst the new system was efficient, it meant no more free-flowing attacking football or high pressing. It made Dortmund dull, a word which you never associate with them. Stoger's system was fine for Köln, a team often fighting relegation, but Dortmund fans could not cope with this. As a result, Favre was brought in, and in fact, he had been the man they wanted to bring in when Tuchel left originally. So Dortmund were delighted when he finally did come in, having shown an ability to work with big name players such as Balotelli, and an ability to rapidly improve young players such as Ter Stegen, Xhaka, Kramer and Royce at Gladbach. He was also renowned for his attacking football, in contrast to Stoger, and being very detail oriented. Throughout his career, Favre always drastically outperformed XG, a key trade when trying to topple a team that's better on paper. Having noted the midfield and defensive problems in the prior season, he moved swiftly in the transfer window. To stiffen up the previously easily bypassed midfield, in came Witzel and Delaney. To improve the defence, in came Diallo and Akanji, as well as Ashraf Hakimi on loan, and Alcacer's loan became permanent. Favre's magic with the young players was in full view in 1819, with Sancho, Hakimi, Zagadou, Akanji and Diallo all excelling. So what tactics did he employ? Firstly, he gave them consistency, employing a 4-2-3-1 in 85% of matches. He has shifted them to a possession-oriented team, meaning that Berkey is often on the ball, with the centre-backs moving slightly wider, which frees the full-backs to move higher up the pitch. This creates a central gap, but the double pivot drops deep, providing multiple options. At the same time, the wide full-backs allow the wingers to drift centrally. Although they are possession-based, they maintain their verticality, so as the defence is comfortable on the ball, they look for line-breaking passes into the midfield. But Favre's game is a numbers game, looking for the numerical advantage wherever the ball is, which is why both pivots drop deep for the ball. They move up as a unit, and the fullbacks are key here, pushing high up and always being available for a switch or a third-man run to get in behind the defence. But again, to get that numerical advantage, one of the centre-backs would often carry the ball into midfield. Favre has used Royce or Goethe as forwards, both of whom are comfortable in the midfield, so they often do drop into the midfield to add numbers. So if the opposition concentrates their defensive options centrally, the fullbacks will make inroads wide, or if the defence stays wide, the front three can combine between the lines easily. Favre's team can also display patience when required, probing for gaps in which to free Sancho, Royce and Goethe. This translated to the final third, where the abundance of wide and central options creates indecision in the opponent on where to focus their numbers. Often the fullbacks would be dragged wide, allowing Royce and Sancho to attack the half spaces and look for goals, or if they went wide, they had numbers centrally to get on the end of crosses. So they took few shots but they were from high percentage regions, meaning that despite the few shots, they managed the second most goals per game. 
Again, Favre's preference for having numbers around the ball means that there were gaps left in behind. But unlike Bosch, whose single pivot system often meant Weigel was overwhelmed in midfield, Delaney and Witzel maintained that security by moving to plug any gaps to stop the counterattacks, meaning that they conceded less from counters. And unlike Bosch, Favre prepared for this situation in the transfer window by buying quick defenders in Akanji, Diallo and Zagadou, who would have the pace to cover the large spaces left behind. When defending, like under Stoger, they were compact and used zone-oriented marking to cut off passing lanes. And when the opponent was in controlled position, they used a medium block, again reducing the space behind the defense. Favre again uses numbers to exceed XG. By positioning players between the ball and the goal, as well as applying pressure on the shooter, it meant that even though they allowed shots from good zones, they didn't concede as often. So in many ways, Favre has combined the best of the two Peters for optimum results. All of this meant that Dortmund finished second, just two points behind Bayern, and would in fact be disappointed to have not won the title. Will 1920 be the season where Dortmund returned to the top? We'll have to wait and see. But what do you make of Favre? Drop it in the comments below. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple.